Well, we're in a continuation of our series from last week, and if you remember last week, we, um, the title of the message was, It's Time to Go. Um, there was a, 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 um, some kind of funny parts of that because it was also the Sunday that we said goodbye uh, to Pastor Tony and his family. And uh, this week, I'm actually continuing the message, and it's going to be called, It's Time to Go, Part 2. Uh, so last week, we talked about Jacob um, recognizing the necessity to flee and to run because he just deceived his brother Esau, not just once, but twice. He, he, he deceived him out of not only his birthright, but he also deceived him out of the spiritual blessing that his father gave him versus his brother. So we covered this, but I think it's always a good reminder. Um, Esau got to the point where he decided he was going to kill his brother. That was the plan. When somebody's trying to kill you, it's time to go, right? That's good advice. If you walk away with anything this morning, you say, what'd your pastor preach about? Well, he told us if somebody's trying to kill us, it's time to go. They'll be like, that's a good word. That's a good word, (laughs) right? And we also talked about the fact that it's easy to go when times are tough. It's easy to go when times are tough. And we looked at how Jacob responded during those hard times. But this week, we're going to talk about what does it look like to go when God calls you back to where you left. So maybe when things are going a little bit better, when things are going well, what does it look like when God says, okay, now I want you to go? That's a little bit harder. It's a little bit more difficult. So in order for us to understand this story, we're going to jump ahead 20 years. We're going to look at the story at the 20-year mark after Jacob had made the decision to flee to Haran. Remember, he went to his uncle Laban up in Haran, and uh, we're going to start at that 20-year mark, but there's a lot of things that happen, so I want you to turn in your Bibles to Genesis uh, chapter 31, and uh, in your pew Bible, it's on page 25, and again, if uh, you are with us, or if this is the first time that you've been with us, we want to tell you that the Bible in front of you is a gift. It is a gift to you from us. We would love the Word of God to leave this place, and so um, if you need a Bible, take the one that's right there, okay? And, and we love it. People all the time, we actually um, have had funerals here, and uh, people in the funeral service, actually Pastor Tom officiated, and he told them the same thing. If you need a Bible, take the one in front of you. And we had people after the funeral service come up and offer to pay for them. Now, now, that's cool, not the pay for part, because we tell them, no, 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 we don't want your money. This is a gift from us to you. But think about the fact that the word of God left this place of a funeral service of somebody that doesn't, that uh, the family doesn't attend our church. That's the power of the Word of God. So, it's a gift from us to you. Now, in order to understand the context, as we jump into Genesis 31, we need to do a little bit of groundwork from Genesis 29 to 30, okay? Because, again, there's a lot of stuff that happens here. One of the key things that happens is the deceiver, Jacob, gets deceived. In fact, he met his match. His uncle Laban was just as crooked and as deceptive as Jacob was, and so this crazy story happens. His uncle Laban has, has two daughters, Rachel and Leah. And uh, in this story, Jacob is out one day tending to Laban's sheep, and Rachel comes walking around the corner, and she's a shepherd. She's a, she's a shepherd, and she's watching after her, her father's flock. And La- uh, Jacob looks at Rachel, and he's like, how you doing, right? <laughs> you know what I mean? You tend sheep too? All right, So he catches this eye for her, and he goes to his uncle, and he's like, listen, I want your daughter. And his uncle Laban, being the shrewd negotiator, says, no problem. I'll give you my daughter, but this is the deal we're going to make. You've got to work for me for seven years. So Jacob's like, well, okay, you know, it seems fair. And the reason was because Laban said, that's my younger daughter. I have an older daughter that really needs to be married first. So if you work for me for seven years, I'll give you my younger daughter first, which is out of order during this time. That's not what you did during this time. So he works for seven years, and at the end of that seven years, he goes to his uncle, and he says, the seven-year period is up, and his uncle says, yes, that is correct. Let's throw the greatest feast this town has ever seen. They throw this big, huge feast, and, and during that time, weddings were multiple-day events. They weren't just singular events, not just one day. They were multiple days, and there was usually a lot of wine that flew, like the salmon of Capistrano, you know? I mean, so... Unfortunately, in that particular moment, Jacob gets completely drunk 
And that evening, his uncle sends in his older daughter, Leah. And so Jacob has, he, he consummates a marriage that he wasn't planning on, and now he's married to Leah. Now, the one thing you have to understand about Leah is she's ugly. Uh, it sounds harsh, doesn't it? Like, who are you to say, right? But the scripture actually said that she has dull eyes, which is scripture for she wasn't the prettiest girl, okay? So in that moment, he wakes up, he rolls over in bed, and he's like, what are you doing here? Now he's married to Leah. So he goes back to his uncle and he says, okay, now listen, you told me you made the deal for Rachel, and his uncle Laban says, that's right, I did. By the end of the week, because in order to make the marriage official, they had to be together for a week. At the end of that marriage week, I'll give you my daughter Rachel as well. So it was like a BOGO, right? So, so and then, I, I can't make this stuff up, folks. I really can't. So, so in that moment, in that moment, he is completely deceived. He gets Rachel's hand, but he has to work for another seven years. So now we are up to 14 years of service for his uncle Laban, and he's earned two daughters and actually two of their slaves. Now, their slaves are actually important to the story as well. Their maidservants, both Leah and Rachel's maidservants, are important. Because you see, Leah and Rachel were kind of like Jacob and Esau. They were always in competition with one another. They were always trying to one-up each other. And what was amazing was, all throughout this story, and all throughout the, even the story moving forward, Jacob had a love and a fondness for Rachel. But he had six boys with Leah, And he had one daughter with Leah. She produced for him six boys. And at that point, Rachel... I'm sorry, what did I say? Um, so with, he had six boys with Leah. Thank you. There we go. Good job. So he had six boys with Leah and, and, uh, and one daughter, and he only had two boys with Rachel. And they were constantly fighting back and forth between who was going to be produced more. And Leah was constantly trying to just earn, she was trying to earn the love of her husband. What's really interesting even about that is all total with um, because they were in such competition, there were times that they were barren. So Jacob actually would then um, have children with their maidservants. All total, there were 12 boys and one daughter born. Now you go to your, you think to yourself, okay, pastor, why is this so important? Man, this is a huge part of the story. Remember, we're talking about origins, the story of us. Where did we come from? If you will go 400 years in the future, you will find the nation of Israel divided into 12 tribes. Are the dashboard lights going off a little bit here? The 12 tribes came from the 12 sons that were born to Jacob. So these 12 sons, six of them from Leah, two of them from Rachel, and then, two, and then four, four more. Sorry, I can't, I, I'm not, I'm not I, so I'm dyslexic. I think some of you know that. Um, so sometimes my, my thoughts get ahead of me. Um, so anyway, there was six boys from Leah, two boys from Rachel, and then the additional... Yeah, the four. No, I'm not. I'm right. I'm right. <laughs> I'm right. Six boys from Leah and two boys from Rachel. That's correct. And then the other four came from the two maidservants. So when, when they, they all had 12 in total, and they became the 12 tribes of Israel, another interesting point is that the line of Jesus didn't come through Rachel. It came through Leah. The line of the Savior, Jesus, came through Leah, which goes to prove the point that the line of Jesus came not through who Jacob chose or wanted, but who God chose and who God wanted. So now we're into an interesting part of our journey, 14 years, 14 years in the making, Jacob says, I want to go home. I've worked for you for 14 years. I've got two wives. I've got two maidservants now. I want to go home. And Laban says, okay, listen, I want you to stay. Because he knew it's profitable for Jacob to stay. And the reason he knew it was profitable is because Jacob and Laban both knew that they were prosperous because of Jacob and because of God. Because God was over them. And he wasn't over Laban, but he was over Jacob for sure. So Laban begs for him to stay. He says, I'll pay you whatever amount that needs to be paid. He says, I'll give you whatever amount. And so Jacob comes up with an interesting plan. So in order to understand the context of where we're going, we need to kind of understand where we're coming from. So in chapter 30, verse 32, 
This is the plan that Jacob comes up with. He says, let me inspect your flocks today. He's talking to his uncle Laban. And remove all the sheep and goats that are speckled or spotted along with all the black sheep. Give these to me as my wages. And so this is the goal. This is the, this is the wage. You know, give me these speckled, spotted, striped, and black sheep. I'll take those. And, it goes, and he says to his uncle, that way, when it's time for me to go, you can look at all my flocks and you can see that I have not cheated you. And so Laban says, deal, <laughs> deal. You got a deal. And then the very next moment, he takes all the spotted, all the streaked, all the white patch and all the black goats and sheep and he wrangles them all up together and he sends them a three days walk away for, with his sons. So even in that moment, he says, deal, you can have all of them, but he takes all of the male and the females away so they can't even reproduce. Three days. I, I actually noted in my Bible, what is wrong with this family? <laughs> like... What is going on, you know? And so now, Jacob, he opens up Jacob's sheep and goat fertility clinic. <laughs> he opens up this shop, and he, and he literally starts to mess around with the breeding practices of these speckled, streaked, white-patched, and black goats and sheep, both male and female. And so he starts to, to go through this whole process of trying to gain this livestock back. And eventually, Jacob gains more wealth and he gains more livestock. In fact, he gets to the point where all of the goats and the sheep that were born to Jacob are more powerful than the ones that were born to Laban. Well, that doesn't go over very well in the old Laban household. <laughs> so we start our story here in Genesis 31. Genesis 31, verse 1 says... But Jacob soon learned that Laban's sons were grumbling about him. Jacob has robbed our father of everything, they said. He has gained all his wealth at our father's expense. And then Jacob began to notice a change in Laban's attitude towards him. Then the Lord said to Jacob, Return to the land of your father and grandfather and to your relatives there, and I will be with you. Now I'll stop here for a second. Last week, we, I had you help finish the sentence with me. I said, when, when God says it's time to go, you respond with, it's time to go. Folks, when God says it's time to go, it's time to go. God said it. God said it right there to Jacob, it's time to go. And Jacob's like, oof, when God says it's time to go, it means it's time to go. So here's the thing. The instruction is to go. The choice is up to Jacob, but the promise is from God. And I will be with you. And I will be with you. The instruction is to go. The choice is up to Jacob, but the promise is from God. That's the same for us even as a church. Now, when I say church, I mean the body of believers together as the church, united, but I also mean you as each individual person that comes into this place today. God calls each of us to do something unique and specific that he called you to do that the person next to you isn't going to do as well as you because he called you to do it. So it's the same for us as a church. The invitation and the, the instruction, I'm sorry, is to go. But the choice is up to you. But the promise is from God. And I will be with you. This is why it's so important to know the difference between whether you're calling yourself to go or whether God is calling you to go. Because when you begin to call yourself to go, guess what? You go out into territory that is very unknown and is very scary, and there's no guarantee of return. The truth is the same with God. Because when God calls you to go, you go out into sometimes uncharted territory, a place of unknown, and you're not guaranteed a return trip. The difference is, when you call yourself to go, guess what? There are times you will be alone. But when God calls you to go, you're never alone. You're never alone. You might be alone in the presence of people. You might look around and go, it feels like there's nobody going with me because the truth is people might not go with you. But Christ is always with you. You are never alone. That's good news. That's good news. You see, here's point, major point number one for you this morning. Major point number one. When God calls you to go, 
he doesn't send you alone. When he calls you to go, he doesn't send you alone. Maybe this morning, God's calling you to leave a bad situation. Maybe he's calling you this morning to leave a bad relationship. Maybe you're realizing that there is grumbling that's happening around you and you're starting to pick up on some things and God is meeting with you saying, okay, it's time to go now, but don't worry, I'll be with you. I'll be with you. Or maybe he's calling you to start something new. Maybe he's calling you this morning to start a new ministry that maybe he's only put on your heart to do. I always love it when God puts stuff on your heart and then you want to put it on mine. I can't tell you the number of conversations I've had where people have come, Pastor, we should do this or we should do this and I feel like God's given us to do this and, and you should start that, Pastor, right? And the reality is you're trying to transfer what God called you to do onto my heart. That's why you all think I'm crazy because I look back at you and I was like, yeah, you should do that. And you're like, no, <laughs> no, you're not hearing what I'm saying. I said, you should do that. And I'm like, no, God didn't tell me to do that. He told you to do it. See, that's the beautiful thing. Maybe he's calling you this morning to step out in faith and to be a life group leader. Maybe he's, maybe he's been working in you and you see needs around us and you're starting to go, whew, I think God's calling me to do something about that. I hope that's true. Because the beautiful thing about that picture is when God calls you to go, he won't send you alone. He won't send you alone. So we have to remember now, God is calling, God is calling Jacob. He's calling him back to a really difficult situation. He's calling him to go back and face his brother. His brother was the one that as he's leaving town, Esau's like standing there with a knife in his mouth and he's like, oh, I'm going to get you when you come back, you know? He was ticked. And so 20 years has passed and all of a sudden God's like, okay, time to go back. Here's the point of that. This is, this is something that you need to hear. God doesn't always call us to easy things. I'm not going to stand up here and sell a lie to you that everything you do that God calls you to is going to be easy. Because there's times it's going to be really difficult. But the difference is, you won't be alone. He's going to go with you. Verse 4, so Jacob called Rachel and Leah out of the field where he was watching his flock. He said to them, I've noticed that your father's attitude towards me has changed. But the God of my father has been with me. You know how hard I have worked for your father. But he has cheated me, changing my wages ten times. But God has not allowed him to do me any harm. We're talking about a person who at first, and actually there's multiple times we can look at Jacob, and, and he is in faith walking with Christ or walking with God, but the reality is there's times where he doesn't really trust him. In fact, next week, next week, the title of my message is Give God a Chance. And we're going to look at a story on how Jacob didn't give God a chance to work because he didn't necessarily trust really what he was saying. And so, so we see this happening, but then look at Jacob's perspective. It begins to change. We see the change of Jacob's perspective right before us. See, that's why it's important to get into his word. Because when you see these little nuances, you begin to go, all of a sudden they jump out off the page and you go, wow, Jacob, like there's a change that's happening here. Look at verse five. But the God of my father has been with me. He just tells him. He just tells his wives I've noticed that your father's attitude stinks towards me. But, but God has been with me. And then he says to him, listen, your uncle, or your father, his uncle, I'll keep that straight, has cheated me. He's changed my, ways, my wages 10 times. But look what he says in verse 7. But God has not allowed him to do me any harm. That's a change in perspective, folks. That's good news. You see, Jacob stopped operating out of fear. He stopped operating out of fear. He began to realize that, listen, although things might not be perfect around me, although things might be really, really difficult and hard sometimes, I have confidence that God is with me. I have the confidence to know that even though I might even get cheated, even though I may even get cheated, I'm okay because God doesn't allow the cheater to win over me. That's good news. So Jacob calls that family meeting. 
He brings Rachel and Leah together. Now, what he's about to reveal blew my mind. Because what he's about to reveal is not how he acquired his wealth, but who acquired his wealth. This is really cool. Genesis 31, verse 10. Now, this is, remember, picture the scene with you. You've got Leah and Rachel. Rachel, they're out in a field. They're standing with their husband. There's, there's uh, sheep and goats all around, a huge flock. Now, at this point, Jacob is very powerful. He looks at his wives, and he says to them, one time during mating season, I had a dream. And I saw the male goats mating with the females that were streaked, speckled, and spotted. Now, folks, (laughs) awkward. (laughs) If you you stop there, this story gets a little weird. You know, one time during mating season, (laughs) I see the speckled and the spotted are all, yeah. So anyway, he keeps going, and you got to keep going, because then he says, in my dream, the angel of God said to me, Jacob, and I replied, yes, here I am. Now, let me tell you. That's a good response. That's a good response. If you ever hear God calling your name, you say, yes, here I am. Here I am. So all of a sudden in that moment, he says, yes, here I am. The angel said, verse 12, look up and you will see that only the streaked, speckled, and spotted males are mating with the females of your flock. For I have seen how Laban has treated you. Stop there. Listen, God sees the way people treat you. God sees the way people treat you. One of the best um, expressions that I've learned over the last couple of years, and there's times when you have kind of maybe difficult conversations and, and meant to or not meant to, sometimes people walk away and you feel really hurt. Have you ever had that? Have you ever been hurt by somebody's words or the way people treat you? One of the things that I learned to say is, I just say to God in my heart, you saw that. God, you saw that. Because the truth is, he did. He did. And sometimes the best thing that you can do in that moment when people say some hurtful things to you is you just need to cry out in your heart, God, you saw that. You saw that. And you'd be amazed how sweet the Spirit pours into you because God in that moment says, you're right, I did. I saw that. He's not a heavenly father that's so far off that he doesn't see the hurt that happens around you. So sometimes you just need to cry out, God, you saw that. Because he does. Now, it's true that God sees the way people treat you. But the inverse to that is also very true. You see, God sees the way that you treat people. God sees the way that you treat people. There might be times that you're on the other end of that and God sees the way that people treated you, but guess what? We are equal offenders in this sometimes as well. And God sees the way that we treat people. And God hears the conversations that we have in response to our president. God sees the, 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 the way that we respond, the way that we react, and the things that we say about, about hate crimes and, and terrorism around the world and nuclear potential holocaust and all of those things. How we respond and what we say is heard by the world around us. What are we communicating in those moments? And, and the reality is that not only does God see when people, when people hurt us and God sees the way that people treat us, but he also sees the way that you treat people. And we've got to be mindful of that for sure. In verse 13, he says, I'm the God who appeared to you at Bethel, the place where you anointed the pillar of stone and made your vow to me. Now get ready and leave. Now remember, this is the continuation of the dream that he shared with them. He shared with them that he had this dream. He says, get ready to leave this country and return to the land of your birth. Now, here's the mind-blowing part. You ready for that? You ready ready for it, church? All right, well, I won't tell you then. So Jacob's dream in Genesis 31, 12, and 13, when he's sharing with them, happened before Jacob's conversation with Laban in Genesis 30, verse 32. Do you remember verse 30, verse 30, or chapter 30, verse 32? Laban and Jacob are making a deal. Jacob looks at at Laban and he says, all right, as my wages, give me all the speckled, spotted, patched, you know, black sheep. And Laban's like, okay, great. Where did he get that idea? He got that idea because God met with him in a dream. 
He got that idea because God had already gone before him. Now, you ready for the even the more mind-blowing part? Yeah. Thank you! <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Here's the amazing thing. That dream was six years before he actually left. Six years. We know, we know that Jacob worked for Laban for 14 years for his daughters. In Genesis 31, verse 41, he says, I worked for you, Uncle Laban, for 20 years, which means at the end of that 14-year mark, Jacob received this, this, this vision from God to, to open up his fertility clinic, and he was going to make all of these, this livestock that was going to provide for him and his family for the rest of his life. And it was six years in the making. Folks, do you know what that says to us? There are times that God's going to give us dreams. He's going to give us visions. He's going to meet with us. But we can't think it's going to happen in six minutes because sometimes it's going to take six years. Sometimes it's going to take us a little bit longer, not because we're impatient or not because we don't want to, but because it's God's timing, not our timing. I'll be honest with you. As the pastor of the church, I've had a vision since September of 2012 for this church. Since September of 2012, God has, has wrangled it in, as a part of my DNA, and I put it aside for three years. I left it alone for three years because I wanted to make sure that it was of God and not of man. All of a sudden, God slowly but surely started to bring that vision back to me. Started to open my eyes again to it. And the amazing thing is, I'm, here we are in 2017, five years after I've started. And I'll tell you, if there's anybody in this room that's chomping more at the bit to get to the vision, it's me. It's me. But here's the coolest thing. When God tells you to go, He's going to give you the means to get you there. When God tells you to go, he's going to give you the means to get you there. So the, it's another way of saying uh, a phrase that maybe you've heard, that, that when God provides the vision, he supplies the provision. Amen? Amen? When God provides the vision, he also provides the provision. So for me, my heart and my attitude right now is, God, if it meant that you started this six years, and this is a six-year plan in the making, and you're going to do something with it, and it's about your timing versus my timing, church, I'm okay with that. I'm okay with that. Because I'd rather be, I'd rather go knowing that God has called us and it's with God than go on our own and find ourselves out in the open. And God going, why are you doing that? It's better to go with them than against them, amen? Because the truth, the reality is, when God says it's time, to go, it's time to go, it's time to go. Church, do you know that it's time to go? It's time to go. I, I mean, the reality for us this morning is that when God tells you to go, you won't go alone. When he calls you to go, you're not going to go alone. I have to be comfortable with the fact that there are people among us that God will call out of our congregation. That's just the part that we play in his kingdom. Just like I keep saying to you week after week, he entrusts people to us so that we can send them out. And I know that that's for a fact going to happen. I pray that it doesn't happen too often to the point where we, we start to really hurt. But the truth is, God's got us. And he's going to go with them and he's going to be with us. And the other reality for us is that when God tells you to go, he's going to give you the means to get you there. He's going to give you the means to get you there. I mean, how amazing is it for us to realize that this morning? What is God calling you to? What's he calling you to this morning? What is he working in you right now that you say, you know what, there's been this little, this little niggling, niggle, right, this little uh, nudging in my heart and, and I, I haven't really been quite sure what to do with it. Maybe it's the seed that God has began to plant in you. Maybe it's the seed that he began to plant in you. Because I believe in the priesthood of all believers. That we're all called. Doesn't mean we're all called to stand up here and to open up the word and to preach the message like I do on Sundays. But it doesn't change the power of the call. 
It doesn't change the power of what God wants to do. And sometimes he plants seeds in you. And I want to, I want to encourage you. I want to encourage you to fertilize that soil. Get into his word. Pray about what he's laying on your heart. Folks, we need you to step up. We need you to recognize that there are needs around us. And I know that for many of you, 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 you've done that. You've been there. And you're kind of going, oh, my word, I don't know if I can keep going. Listen to me. When God calls you, he also gives you the strength to do it. And sometimes we need to step out on faith and, we need, to, and we, need to, we need to start that new ministry or we need to become that life group leader or we need to, we need to start teaching that Christian education class or we need, to, we need to start being a part of what's happening in our community around us. We need to start seeing that, you know what, God gave me this gift. I can, I can figure out a way to make that happen. Because he's going to give you the strength to do it too. Folks, it's time to go. It's time to go. We can't be worried about what's not happening. We can't be worried about who's not here. Well, truthfully, we do need to be worried about who's not here because there's a whole world around us that's dying every day without Christ in their heart, in their life. And we are in desperate need. We are in desperate need for us to carry that light, to reach people, to equip people, to reach people. Amen? Amen. Would you stand with me as we close this morning? I'm going to ask Pastor Caleb to come and just, just play quietly. And uh, I, I'm not, uh, you know, this morning going to ask anybody to respond or come down to the front. I mean, obviously, I, you hear me say this all the time, that the altar is always open. You don't need an invitation to come to meet with Christ at the altar. But I just kind of have that, that sneaking suspicion in me that God's planting seeds and that we need to recognize that He's calling some of us to go. And when he calls us to go, it's time to go. So I'm just going to give you a few seconds just to process in your heart what God is, what, what God is speaking into you. Gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, this morning we're challenged, not by my words, <laughs> but by your presence, by your words, words that challenge our hearts to think outside the box, to think outside of ourselves to think about not necessarily even where we are, but where we are going. To recognize that there are moments that you call us, but, 
but the fruitfulness of that doesn't happen until years later. Lord, may we be patient enough to hear from you and to know that you are calling us. We want to be confident, Lord, that you are speaking into our situations and into our circumstances. Lord, that there's many here in this place who are, who are in desperate need to call out of bad and terrible situations. Lord, I'm praying right now that you would give them the power and the confidence to walk away from those bad relationships or those bad situations or, or even terrible conversations or uh, whatever it is, Lord Jesus, that you're calling us out of. I pray that you give them the confidence to walk away with confidence and boldness to know that you haven't left them, that you will walk with us. Lord, I also pray for the strength for, for maybe this morning there are some that say, you know, I, I have to be faithful to what God is working into me. And in that, it's going to mean having to maybe change my schedule. And it might mean having to sacrifice some things. And it might mean being more tired. Lord, I pray that you'd give them strength not to see the limitations that they have in their humanness, but to see the incredible, the, the incredible capacity that you have in your holiness. Because you can pour into them more than they can even pour into themselves. And Lord, as a church, as a church this morning, we're reminded of the, of the challenge before us. That the instruction from you is to go. The choice is up to us. But the promise is from you. That you will be with us. And now, Trinity, I ask that you hold your hands out and receive this benediction this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen and amen. You are sent.